Thank you, Colin, and welcome to the Australian National University. And I too acknowledge that we meet on the land of traditional owners and I too pay my respects to elders past and present. Kevin, welcome back. Chancellor, I should treat you with respect. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, there's a first for everything, isn't there? <laughs> now... Touché. <laughs> Bishop I, 15, Rudd Zero. <laughs> I am delighted to welcome my friend and a former parliamentary colleague and an alumnus of this university. And as Chancellor, Kevin, I'm delighted to be involved in the launch of your book. You, of course, uh, were a Prime Minister of this country and I think equally important, the Foreign Minister during some very challenging times, and you knew I'd say that, but you most certainly had a, sting a distinguished parliamentary career. So I want to pay tribute to you and congratulate you for taking on this challenge of how to manage great power competition that will define our world for many years to come. And your primary motivation, having read your book and flagged it extensively, is one that we all share, and that is to avoid a catastrophic conflict between the United States and China. So let me get into it. First question. I'll start with, obviously, a question that's been on my mind and no doubt that of others who have read this book. In your 10 scenarios for how this competition could play out, five of them involve military action, military conflict. You observe that war is most certainly not inevitable. Are you hopeful? Are you optimistic that conflict can be avoided? And which scenario do you regard as most probable? Well, thanks, Julie. Thank you for the kind welcome back to the university. Always be good to be here at the ANU. I tried to sketch out <clears throat> how this could all end because it remains an abstraction. That is US-China relations and the, and the emerging conflict between them uh, in many people's minds, unless you try and make it concrete. So I've tried to cast ahead a decade through the decade of what I describe as the decade of living dangerously. And uh, you're right, five of those scenarios <clears throat> arise in and around the Taiwan question. Uh, and of those, I talk about America's Munich moment, uh, which would be a crisis arises over Taiwan and America chooses to do nothing. Uh, alternatively, I describe um, America's uh, uh, Waterloo, which is a crisis arises over Taiwan uh, and America is defeated because that would become a Waterloo moment for the future of the United States as a regional and global power. Um, thirdly, I describe another scenario which I describe as uh, Midway, which is uh, again drawing on the analogies of the Second World War. It was the Battle of, the Mid of Midway which turned the war against Japan. In other words, America prevailed. And then I talk about um, what I call the 38th parallel scenario, which is a drawing from the analogy of the Korean War, which is it ends up <clears throat> as a bloody divided conflict, not dissimilar to the way in which Ukraine is currently emerging. And certainly the case of the Korean War and the armistice of uh, 53. And the final one, uh, which I do hope to be the case, uh, is one where deterrence continues to work um, and that when Xi Jinping or the Chinese leadership more broadly look to roll the dice on the future of the Taiwan question, they look hard at the military equation, they look hard at the financial and economic cost <clears throat> and at that point they say too difficult. Um, the whole purpose of the book is to push us in that direction to kick the can down the road during the 2020s uh, 
so that the effective deterrence on the part of the Taiwanese themselves and their American ally, and possibly other allies, causes our Chinese friends and the Chinese Communist Party to think again. Kevin, your framework of managed strategic competition uh, requires both sides to engage in good faith negotiations and for confidence building measures to establish trust. But you do note in the book that trust has been in short supply for a long period and that both sides regard the other as dishonest. So how could that trust be developed? Well, one of our mutual friends in the past, Julie, who was head of Indo-Pacific Command, prior to that call, Pacific Command, an American admiral who will remain nameless here, said to me one day, after a very, very long drink, he said, uh, Prime Minister, uh, trust is a much overrated thing. Um, and he's right. Remember Reagan's great aphorism, trust but ver verify. Uh, the guts of what I actually recommend in this book is more to do with verification than trust because the level of strategic distrust between the two has now reached unprecedented uh, proportions. China is now much more powerful. Under Xi Jinping, it's more assertive. The Americans are pushing back. Um, but when I talk about many strategic competition, uh, Julie, I'm not talking about something fanciful. If you look at the evolution of the US-Soviet relationship, and the near-death experience we all had in 1962 in the Cuban Missile Crisis. What evolved in the 30 years after that and before the collapse of the Soviet Union effectively were a set of rules of the road, uh, guardrails in the ultimate US-Soviet relationship. And despite the fact the Cold War was fiercely fought, it never reached the existential uh, dimensions that it acquired in 1962. And the rest of the Cold War, by and large, was prosecuted in third countries, proxy wars and the rest. It was ugly, it was difficult, it was ideological, it divided countries and peoples. But de facto, what the Americans and the Soviets did in that post-62 period was evolve certain rules of the road. At present in the US-China relationship, those rules of the road have disappeared. Uh, they've gone up the spout and down the other side uh, literally over the last decade, so that if we had an incident at sea tomorrow between a US frigate and a Chinese destroyer somewhere in the South China Sea, despite the fact that formal protocols now exist since 2014 on managing incidents at sea, there is no effective operating hotline now between the two militaries, nothing. So what I seek to do in this recommendation about managed strategic competition is to begin to outline how this could be filled in um, and around five sets of strategic red lines between the two countries in order to reduce, not eliminate, but reduce the risk of crisis escalation, conflict and war by accident. More broadly, one of the challenges you explore in the book is the disconnect in perceptions of how each side views the world, their mm. world view. And you've written in great depth about Xi Jinping's um, world view and his 10 concentric circles of interest. Now, one of these is rewriting the global rules-based order. I recall very well when I was foreign minister in 2016 that China rejected the ruling of the Permanent Court of Arbitration um, under UNCLOS that China's territorial claims in the South China Sea were illegal or not mm. based on fact. So that's just one example. What would those global rules look like if China were the dominant power and what implications would that have for Australia? Yeah, what I try to do in the book, in the middle part of the book, is describe what I uh, call Xi Jinping's worldview. If you're familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, this is an attempt to give a Chinese Communist Party equivalent in terms of what is most important to that which is less important. Um, but they're all important, and I see them as a series of concentric circles. My framework, not the Chinese framework. 
And your question, Julie, goes to the last of those, which is Xi Jinping's plans for the future of the international system. How would it differ? Right now, what China is doing, as you know from your time as foreign minister, is two things. Within the existing rules-based system, through the United Nations, through the Bretton Woods institutions, uh, is to slowly turn these institutions in the direction of Chinese interests and values <clears throat> through large-scale personnel appointments, uh, huge new contributions to the UN budget, uh, but also changing, this is where it's quite important, the normative structure uh, which underpins a number of inter international institutions. Of course, this is most spectacular in the efforts which China now engages in in partnership with the Russian Federation to strip out all the human rights clauses uh, from uh, UN resolutions, both in the General Assembly, Security Council and elsewhere. And you see literally swarms of Chinese officials in global gatherings seeking to strike consensus with supporters from Latin America and Africa and elsewhere to do that. So if you ask what a difference is, a clear difference is what they're doing there. The other arm of China's, uh, let's call it, um, international system strategy is to create their own institutions, completely independent of those fashioned in 44-45. Belt and Road Initiative, uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and others, China's various plus one arrangements around the world. And the whole idea then is to create Sinocentric systems uh, where China is the anchoring power within them. And as China does this, it's basically uh, domesticating from its own point of view the existing system, creating a new system and calling the lot, as Xi Jinping's rubric is, a community of common destiny for all humankind. And then roll the clock along 30 years, it would look quite different to what it looks like today. Now, you write <clears throat> that the US political system is reasonably transparent and robustly debated and is studied in great detail by Chinese analysts while China's system is, well, um, more secretive, opaque and not studied to the same extent in Washington. And so here's my Dorothy Dixer. Which system of decision-making has the greater resilience and propensity to produce better policy decisions? And I am referring in part to the bitterly partisan divide we see in Washington at present. Well, let me answer your question in two ways. The first is, the US body politic and the rest of us as allies of the United States need to spend a whole lot more time understanding the drivers of China's international political behavior. By and large, the American body politic is institutionally lazy because it's part of the Anglosphere. And for the last 250 years, either the British or the Americans have kind of ruled the waves. And as a result, if you're in the capitals of the Anglosphere, uh, which of the two countries worst in the world for speaking foreign languages? The British and the Americans. Um, the British sometimes say they can understand American and the Americans sometimes understand they can understand British, but that's about it. Have, ever heard them speak French? It's excruciating. <laughs> but, um, uh, and they take pride in not speaking foreign languages. Well, you know, this is pretty uh, odd because most of China's rising generation of leaders, not Xi Jinping's generation, but the one coming after him, the vast majority of them understand English and are deep students of the politics, economics and decision-making processes of the rest of the world. Not in reverse. It's not just China's opacity, which is difficult. Um, it's surmountable. If you, if you have a body of people who put the research effort into understanding China's domestic political drivers, that's kind of what we try and do in the think tank I now run in the United States. Second part of your question is, which, act which system ultimately affords uh, greatest resilience? Well, like yourself, my friend, you know, I'm a kind of an old-fashioned believer in free uh, association in politics, free association uh, in society, and also open and free economies. And it's not just because it's a universal human craving for freedom. From a systemic point of view, these systems are usually the most resilient. 
elections for all their failings, and we're in the midst of one at the moment in this country, um, they're kind of the political equivalent of um, a floating exchange rate. They are automatic shock absorbers, adjustment mechanisms, when the systems lurch too far in one direction, uh, as the government of your persuasion has most recently. It's a gratuitous <laughs> comment on the way through. <laughs> We got in 20 minutes without saying anything bad, and I broke my duck. I'm sorry. <laughs> but what unites us is that we actually look at the system and we think for all the faults of the crazy American system which can produce Trump, what's happening in the Republican Party, et cetera, et cetera. Ultimately, open markets, open societies, and open politics, political systems, uh, they self-adjust. The rigidity in an authoritarian system, be it communist or, shall I say it, neo-communist in the case of the Russian Federation, these are rigid authoritarian systems which one day crack and then collapse with enormous systemic consequences. Yet you did warn in your book of a rise in jingoistic nationalism in both the United States and China and nationalism of course has um, often been exploited by political populists and can lead to conflict. So how can the rest of the world or at least the allies encourage the United States to step back from the partisan divide that is plaguing its political system and to re-engage in constructive debate and compromise. Now, I ask that question because I'm assuming that the task of influencing China's leaders to refrain from nationalistic propaganda is a much more um, challenging task. It's interesting you say that because within the Chinese system there are debates about this as well. There are two different words in Chinese um, which relate to what we would often call nationalism in this country. There's a different word for patriotism, and nationalism, which is the first is a good term and the second is a bad term in the way in which the Chinese conceive it. And so uh, all Chinese are patriots, not all Chinese are nationalists. Uh, the same in various of our countries as well. Secondly, Chinese being a sophisticated political culture understand full well that political leaders will use and abuse nationalism to advance a particular agenda, particularly if your domestic political legitimacy is in difficulty in terms of other changes you're making to the country in question. So there is therefore a discourse in China on uber-nationalism. In fact, a friend and colleague of mine is a Chinese academic teaching at Tsinghua University, he recently made a remarkable observation saying that the under <clears throat> Chinese millennials, he uses that term, in his classes, so in other words, kids under the age of 22, uh, now studying international relations at Tsinghua University in Beijing, he says are utterly different from those who have preceded them because the nationalist diet under which they have grown up in the last eight or nine years um, effectively causes them instinctively to demonise the United States and the collective West. Not the case, frankly, for the previous 30 years or so. So there is a discourse within China on this question. In terms of the United States, <clears throat> I think so much of our futures hangs on this future debate within the Republican Party. Uh, Democrats are not saints, but they are less uh, addicted to the drug of nationalism as a tool in domestic politics as, uh, as the Republicans. And what I fear is whether it's um, DeSantis or other candidates for the 2024 nomination, the ripping forward the nationalist lever in order to secure the nomination, uh, nationalist lever of America v China, uh, and then somehow mysteriously believing that nationalist rhetoric equals a sophisticated or effective national China strategy, that is one of the dangers that we are therefore presented with. What can we do about it? Friends and partners of the United States and allies like ourselves, um, there's a responsibility for us to engage our American friends, simultaneously our Chinese friends, and say this sort of stuff doesn't help solve a problem. And by the way, if you don't solve the problem, the rest of us get sucked into the vortex. So I think there is an opportunity for us to engage in that discourse so long as we're not as it were, imbibing the nationalist pill ourselves. 
which is a separate question. <clears throat> now, you've also commented about the concept of comprehensive national power and how China uses that as a benchmark about its relative strengths, particularly with regard to the United States. Now, you've written about this and spoken about this before. In this book, you observe that the confrontation in Anchorage between senior US and Chinese officials back in March of 2021 was confirmation that the relationship was on a radically different course than previously. Now, does that shift in China's attitudes in particular come from growing confidence uh, from measures such as comprehensive national power? Now, can we assume that China now regards itself as at least the equal of the United States, because that's the impression I got from those Chinese officials. They were treating the United States at least as their equal. Absolutely. Um, and that's what the public theatre of that meeting in Anchorage between Yang Jiechi and Tony Blinken, the US Secretary of State, and Wang Yi, the foreign minister, both of whom we know, uh, as well as Jake and have Sullivan. Been subjected to his theatre before. <laughs> yes, you've had a bit of that, haven't you? The um, uh, and this was uh, a calculated piece of theatre, uh, and it was about China's assertion of its moment uh, in international discourse, where it now addressed the United States robustly as a strategic equal. There was a there was a um, a uh, prequel to this. Uh, several years before, you remember the Chinese doctrine of a new type of great power relations uh, under Xi Jinping from about 2014. That was actually China's first play at having itself seen domestically, internationally, as a power equivalent to the United States. Underpinning it all, though, what, what's it about? You correctly point to this term, comprehensive national power. The Chinese expression is zonghe guoli, it's been around for, from about the beginning of the Deng period, for about 20 years ago, for about 20 years until about 2015. The Chinese, through various publications, produced uh, comprehensive national power tables comparing themselves with other countries, including the United States. We used to come down sort of toward the end of the list, Australia. But, um, but we were still uh, up there in the top 12. Uh, and then mysteriously, about 2014-15, they stopped being published. And the reason for that was China was now emerging towards the top of the table. And I thought it was actually bad public relations to be seen to be self-aggrandizing in that way. But if you dig deep in the ideological discourse internally, uh, as nerds like me are predis predisposed to do, then underneath uh, that uh, set of comparative tables is a continuing... Uh, refrain in the Chinese internal political uh, discussion, which is, as we reach power parity with the United States, we can now more robustly articulate our power in the world. It's a deeply realist framework of international relations and strategic policy. As to whether they've concluded that in all categories of CNP, as they call it, comprehensive national power, that they are now either equal to or greater than the United States, uh, the matrix they use has multiple components. In some, they would regard themselves as equal or ahead, and others, like semiconductors, they would see themselves as significantly behind. So it's still a variable feast, but if you aggregated it, they would see themselves now as being in the ballpark. Kevin, I digress for a moment. Uh, you will be aware that I was the Henry Kissinger Fellow at the McCain Institute in 2021 and I carried out some research projects and interviewed you for one of my papers. Was I a good interviewee? You were wonderful, but Thank it was you. all Chatham House, so I just put your name down. I don't exactly say what you said, but I think people will know which bits were yours in the research. Anyway. Did I use programmatic specificity? <laughs> Don't you always? <laughs> so I interviewed a number of former leaders and I found it much more um, frank and honest as an exchange because they were no longer constrained by being in office. So former Prime Minister Abe, former Prime Minister Rudd, former Prime Minister Cameron and the like. Um, 
specifically in relation to the United States, the consistent theme from this research from the Indo-Pacific leaders was the concern about the United States having too much of a focus on the military perspective. And those whom I consulted wanted to see more US leadership, but they wanted more economic engagement in the region. And they wanted to see US private sector engagement, and that was highly valued. Do you think that the United States sees that its economic weight is as valuable, if not more, than its military perspective in its engagement with developing nations in particular? And I want you to see this in the context of Solomon Islands in particular. You're right. It, you're, the point that you raised, Julie, comes logically out of a discussion of comprehensive national power. The Chinese may regard themselves in conventional armory as being a power equivalent to the United States within East Asia and the West Pacific. But when it comes to every arm of economic power, from trade through investment, through capital markets and currency markets and technology and innovation, they would regard themselves as, on balance, becoming dominant. And you simply have to look at the size of the Chinese economic footprint right across what we now call the Indo-Pacific region, and frankly globally, against the American footprint. China, as we now know, is the world's largest trading country, the world's largest importer, the world's largest exporter. It's the second largest source of foreign direct investment in the world. And if you aggregated capital markets, it's certainly huge after both um, uh, China, as after the United States and the Europeans. So do the Americans get it in terms of what I regard to be the core element of Chinese grand strategy, which is to cause China to become, in the region and the world, the indispensable economic partner. And under those circumstances, to induce their, in, their partners, economic partners, into a position whereby they uh, yield on questions of foreign policy conflict uh, with China's core national interests. That is the universal Chinese strategy. So the only way to roll back against that is if the United States rediscovers um, its centrality in the global economy which if you're run by a bunch of dumb protectionists in the United States Congress is really hard. And they are seriously dumb, like indescribably dumb. Republicans and you're Democrats You're doing a good job of dumb. describing them. <laughs> They're not indescribable. No, no, they are just really bad on this stuff. Like for all of our sins in this country, Labor and Liberal, for the last, you know, 25 years, we've both been uh, non-protectionist free traders. And that's one of the reasons why this country remains prosperous, despite all of our you know, economic challenges. That divide, that division, however, still exists in the United States Congress now within the Republican Party, and certainly between free trading Democrats and free trading uh, Democrats as well. So the, the Achilles heel for America's global strategy uh, is the economy. The Achilles heel within that is trade protectionism. Can they turn this corner? The recently released Indo-Pacific Economic Framework by the administration is one step in that direction. It may point towards the Americans pursuing a digital strategy, digital commerce strategy across the Indo-Pacific, which is much more open and less closed than the current trade strategy dealing with physical goods and services. But we have to crack the protectionist sentiment of the Congress itself because there's votes to be ha had in them bar hills uh, out of uh, protectionist rhetoric, which causes, uh, in my view, dishonestly, constituencies in various parts of regional and rural America to think that if you're protectionist, somehow you're going to save a whole bunch of local jobs. In fact, you'll undermine America's power in the world. But let's look at it this way. You, you write, or you in fact borrow a US political slogan in the book, you observe, it's the economy, stupid. And the United States has demonstrated an extraordinary, a remarkable capacity for innovation and reinventing itself. And um, its uh, market economy is still the largest and one of the most competitive and efficient in the world. And, you know, you look at um, 
issues like the rankings of US universities, they still dominate the great universities. Now, I think it's fair to say that under Xi Jinping, China has uh, changed direction to some extent. Its economy is less competitive and more dominated by state-owned enterprises. And both nations, quite frankly, are grappling with large debt burdens. So does that give the United States a greater longer-term edge uh, to deliver, you know, sustainable economic growth and to be the preferred model for development globally. I reckon there are two fascinating megatrends underway right now on the question which you have just raised. One is, can America continue to reinvent itself economically and technologically and entrepreneurially despite its protectionist predispositions, which I described just before, to which the answer is quite possibly, quite possibly. The inherent dynamism of the show is still there. Uh, so long as they maintain an open immigration policy, despite other forces in US domestic politics pushing in the reverse direction, and despite their pre and if they can roll back against the protectionist sentiment that I described before, then their ability to continue to reinvent themselves and to grow uh, is formidable, particularly if they see NAFTA um, and what's now called Mexico, Canada, USA um, under Trump. Uh, that free trade agreement brings together basically half a billion people uh, in an economic entity in North America which has a capacity to become of itself a huge global powerhouse if seen as an integrated economic entity. Now the parallel mega trend is what you correctly pointed to before, Julie, which is Xi Jinping's economic script going off to the left in a statist direction, state-owned enterprise direction, less accommodating of the private sector. Look at the crackdown on the Chinese mega tech platforms, uh, not just Alibaba and Tencent and JD and Didi and the rest, um, but also now the assault on the property sector, which equals 29% of GDP, together with a series of messages about a common prosperity agenda, which indicates that uh, private wealth is now to be um, looked at as scants uh, in China. And what I do see, and I've been writing about this now for about three years, is declining levels of business confidence, declining levels of productivity growth, and declining levels of uh, private fixed capital investment growth. And these are the generators of um, long-term economic dynamism. Throw into that the big mega drivers of growth long-term. Population, participation, workforce participation and productivity. Population in China peaks either now or before 2027. Uh, it's already aging hugely. And the, and the women of China are going on strike. Uh, the birth, natural birth rate's about 1.43. It's, it's lower than the Republic of Korea, even though per capita income in uh, China's case is considerably lower than the ROK. So that's what's happening with population. Workforce participation, the workforce size in China peaked in 2014. And productivity has been bumping along at somewhere between 0 and 1% for most of the period of Xi Jinping's administration. And so add all that to the underpinning shift in let's call it business sentiment. Then we begin to look at a scenario which was outlined I think in a Lowy paper recently, but also by a piece by a colleague of mine in the United States, Dan Rosen, which is are we now looking at peak China in terms of China's growth peaking much earlier than our analytical assumptions in the pre-Xi Jinping period had assumed. And that the argument then is that the Chinese economy measured, measured as GDP uh, at market exchange rates will either just fall short of the US economy by 2032 or maybe just ahead of the US economy in 2032 but not by much, no doubling and trebling the size of the Americans. And this is happening because of a series of policy missteps within China itself and the long-term legacy of the one-child policy. Now I have two final questions before we go to the audience. So one's looking forward, one's looking back. Uh, 
You described Xi Jinping as a master tactician who is willing to take calculated risks, a bit of a crash or crash through mentality. Now, we've both seen clever tacticians in political parties, but what's usually missing is those with long-term strategic views. Mm. Does President Xi have the capacity to drive big picture strategic planning in support of his you know, grand vision of rejuvenation of Chinese prestige and power? Is he the guy? I think his uh, statecraft um, is incomplete. Uh, if statecraft equals A, controlling in a Machiavellian sense your internal politics, then the guy, as I've described before, runs his own masterclass. He has an ability phenomenally to anticipate where the next level of opposition is going to come from and to take them out six months before they worked out that that's what they were going to do. Um, like, it's quite phenomenal how this guy has consolidated power in such a short period of time. So in terms of the dark arts of Machiavellian politics, uh, he's right out there with Sussex Street. Um, so uh, <laughs> the... Uh, see? Self-criticism. <laughs> the... Uh, and uh, and uh, but uh, as for the economic vision, I actually believe he doesn't get it mm. because he has no instinctive feel for how a market economy actually works. Whereas his predecessors did, Hu Jintao, yeah. Jiang Zemin, Deng Xiaoping. Remember Deng Xiaoping's aphorism: "Doesn't matter whether the cat is black or white, as long as it catches mice, it's glorious to be rich." So these were not heavily Marxist-Leninist concepts. Um, and so and that's why the, basically the, economy, the Chinese economy just ripped along and roared along for 35 years. So the, that's missing. And then the third element is there's a question mark, which is too far too soon, overreach too early. And, for example, uh, with Xi Jinping's belief that his personal and institutional relationship with Putin, the Russian Federation, represented the en an enduring strategic wisdom for China to lock itself into the Russian position on Ukraine. Whereas I think many in the Chinese system would have said, this is going too far because we don't know how it's gonna end. And uh, we don't want to bury ourselves into divisive positions within Europe because the European Union is a significant long-term global partner of the Chinese economy and system. But if you as the Chinese, through Xi Jinping's relationship with Putin, say, um, we're going to back in the Russian position on legitimate territorial interests unspecified and explicitly oppose future NATO expansion in Europe, way beyond China's geographical and national security interests in this region, then the Chinese system internally is saying, this is going beyond what we would describe as sound long-term vision. So I'm saying therefore in these three baskets, domestic politics, the economy, and let's call it foreign policy vision and execution, it's a mixed bag. Now, my final question is looking back, but not too far, not in Chinese terms. You write of inflection points in the US-China relationship and one of them, which I found fascinating, was the infamous post-World War I decision of then US President Woodrow Wilson, um, UK uh, Prime Minister Lloyd George and the French were there too, to reject China's key demands, including on unfair treaties and the return of the former German possession in Shandong. Now, you and I have both been subjected to discussions with Foreign Minister Wang Yi when he insists that the United States will be an unreliable partner and will betray Australia and our interests when it needs it the most. I've had that conversation with Wang Yi many times. You write that had President Wilson stood up to Japan during that meeting at Versailles at the beginning of the 20th century, history since that time may well have been different in that China would have responded differently. Now, how did the events from that time affect the subsequent attitudes of 
Chinese leadership or do you think they're still using that as a cover for their more assertive behaviour of late? I think the, um, the 1919 question uh, is a genuine intellectual question of alternative history, how history could have unfolded differently. Um, and it's not therefore an exercise in, let's call it the retrospective justification of uh, future Chinese strategic behavior. Uh, there's an argument that um, China's um, being on the receiving end of foreign occupation of one form or another from the first opium wars through to the end of the second world war, the so-called hundred uh, years of national humiliation, it was not only genuinely experienced but becomes a utilitarian tool in contemporary politics to justify at home and abroad a more assertive Chinese security policy today under the rubric of never and I think okay but 1919, 1919 I think is worthy of a separate reflection it's kind of along these lines Chinese Empire collapses in 1911 last Qing Emperor uh, you have this untidy period with the birth of the Chinese Republic under Sun Yat-sen. Um, and China is searching to find its own way. And you have the emergence of Republican parties and uh, nascent socialist parties in China in this extraordinarily dynamic decade of 1911-1921. And the galvanizing experience within that period in part was China's continued disunity and continued occupation by a range of foreign powers on the one hand, and on the other hand, um, you had uh, Woodrow Wilson's success in persuading the Chinese to send hundreds of thousands of workers to Europe uh, to dig trenches um, on the Western Front, unknown to all of us, not part of you know, the standard you know, Western history of, uh, of the Great War. But the implicit deal between the Chinese president at the time um, and Woodrow Wilson uh, was that once this war is done, then German colonies in China uh, around Qingdao and uh, the greater and large parts of the province of Shandong would therefore be returned to Chinese sovereignty. That was the issue at Versailles. Woodrow Wilson had made that undertaking and then reneged on it when the Japanese said, unless this is given to us, then we will not sign the peace treaty or become part of the League of Nations. And so because the League of Nations was so dear to the heart of uh, Woodrow Wilson, uh, he yielded because he saw China as the, as it were, the inferior party to this uh, overall grand strategic bargain. In the meantime, all these nationalist leaders in China, the, who later became communists, including a very young Mao Zedong, uh, Li Da Zhao and Chen Du Xiu, uh, two of the early founders of the Chinese Communist Party, were all on the record in 1918-19 shouting Woodrow Wilson's praises for being the great man of democracy of our time who would restore China's dignity. When the news finally came out of Versailles that in fact the reverse had happened and that the former German colonies in uh, China had been handed to the Japanese, because the Japanese had been allies uh, in the First World War, this sentiment was turned 180 degrees and the Chinese Communist Party in uh, the aftermath of what was called the May the 4th movement in 1919 was formed. And it then became a rallying cry within uh, radical Chinese politics, particularly Chinese Communist politics, that the United States and its democratic model was unreliable for the future. So this was a crucible, frankly, which set off much of the history of the subsequent hundred years. I think this is a genuine missed historical opportunity uh, for China, its domestic discourse, and its relationship with the rest of the world as it emerged from 2,000 years of imperial rule. And the Chinese Communist Party, 26 years later, went on to become uh, the successful rev revolutionary power in China. Kevin, just before I hand over, I must um, comment that Henry Kissinger described you as one of the most thoughtful analysts on China and its development. And he asked the question, can the United States and China avoid sleepwalking into conflict? And he describes your book as providing the answers, an option and ways for them to avoid precisely that outcome. 
So congratulations on the reviews that the book has received. I urge you to buy it and read it. Or, and or buy multiple copies. <laughs> Friends, I, I'm family. I'm now in retail. <laughs> and he will personally sign it. I can assure you of that. But congratulations on this book, Kevin, and may you continue as a distinguished alumnus of our university. Uh, make your views and thoughts and analyses and perspectives known on this most important of topics. Congratulations. Thanks, Julie. Appreciate it. Well, you don't get that kind of conversation every day of the week. Um, uh, former Prime Minister Rudd, Chancellor Julie Bishop, thank you both uh, very, very much for that uh, stimulating conversation. Now, we, we are going to try and cram in some questions. I know that we've, we've overrun a little bit, but uh, this was definitely a, a conversation that we didn't want to stop. So if people do want to ask questions, there are microphones just down here on either side. Please make your way quite quickly um, because we don't have much time. Um, I can't believe, ah, excellent, I was going to say, I can't believe there are no questions. Okay, you sir, and just be mindful of, of Colin's earlier request that you, you, you keep it short and end with a question mark. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you for the talk and congrats on the, on the book. Uh, so you mentioned uh, various instances of nationalism coming out of both the US and China, and you've also mentioned how China and Russia has been stripping out mentions of human rights uh, in various UN resolutions. Uh, so I'm just wondering, uh, is there much of a rhetoric coming out of China on a sort of seeing US-China relationship from an ideological point of view rather than a nationalistic point of view? And do you think an ideological conflict could be either less dangerous, more dangerous, or uh, equivalent to a nationalistic conflict? Thanks. It's a really good question because um, when we look at, let's just say, the Chinese perspective, I won't talk about the United States. But the United States is uh, now seen within the Chinese Communist Party through two prisms. One is a continuing nationalist prism, which is China, century of humiliation, national humiliation, finally achieving its uh, uh, great national rejuvenation. Uh, uh, and that means becoming once again, as they were in the middle Qing period, the world's largest power. At a parallel track, the Chinese Communist Party is also a Marxist-Leninist party. And for my sins, I've been reading all these dense ideological documents uh, published in the party's theoretical journal, Chiu Shi, about uh, how, in fact, they conceive of the current set of circumstances in the world. And the forces of dialectical materialism and historical materialism very much inform a, an ideological Marxist-Leninist view that the West, the democratic capitalist West, is in, in inexorable decline. And that the rise of China is not just a force of history, it's also a factor of global socialism. And so you have this intertwining of these two ideological dimensions in the Chinese worldview. And therefore, uh, these are animating um, from the party's point of view and not just a nationalist point of view, uh, a conclusion that China's time has come. Final point, Marxist Leninists also have a view of historical determinism which is that this is not just a matter for discourse and debate, but that the forces of history are with them. Uh, okay? And that is China's rise is unavoidable. It is uh, written not in the stars, but it's written in the dynamics of dialectical and historical materialism. And frankly, I find that a bit spooky uh, because... Uh, uh, because uh, when you are encountering folks who believe that their time as a nation has come, that's one thing. But when you encounter folks, a particular set of political leaders or a group within a political party, the Chinese Communist Party, who believe that it's the equivalent of a dialectical destiny, um, then that becomes uh, deeply concerting. At the end of Xi Jinping's speeches, he has often used this expression, um, and our view of the world is zheng chue, correct. And that means, ideologically, we've discerned scientific truth, uh, 
because Marxism Lenin is a science. It's not a social science, it's a science with inherent historical laws of development and that China's rise has followed those laws of development and for those reasons China will, will prevail. So it's this double dimension, ideological in terms of Marxism Leninism, ideological also in terms of continuing Chinese nationalism. Thank you. Next question, please. Um, do you think that free association deals ending, like supposedly in the 2024-2023 period juncture in the Pacific region between countries like the US and the Solomon Islands will influence like China's economic advances in the Pacific region? And more specifically, do you think that China's emphasis on cultural and soft power elements in terms of like showing respect to political leaders of Pacific regions is equally important in creating these stronger developed relations and countering America's relations with these countries? Well, China's had a long-standing strategy of seeking to identify opportunities in the Pacific Island countries. Julie and I have both observed these during our respective periods in office. Um, China has often seen opportunities to run bilateral aid programs among Pacific Island countries uh, with no conditionalities, often infrastructure-related projects um, and often those with no particular strings attached. More importantly, also with no um, conditionality concerning democracy and human rights in those countries. For example, I think it's fair to say we had a bipartisan position on the military coup in Fiji uh, in Australia until Fiji eventually returned to democratic norms of government. The Chinese message to the Pacific Island countries is we don't care what your form of government is, whether it's democratic, whether it's a military dictatorship, etc. So for those reasons, it represents a uh, formidable challenge in terms of the message which has been put, reinforced by aid levels of which have been sustained. So I think uh, the Chinese strategy here in the Pacific Island countries will not be limited to the Solomons. Uh, it extends right across all 13 Pacific Island countries which make up the Pacific Island Forum. And whoever wins the next Australian election is going to have a massive challenge on their hands uh, in order to uh, restore, and I'm trying not to be partisan here, Australia's credibility uh, in the region across all the instruments of influence uh, in the region which we, together with the New Zealanders, have traditionally exercised. I'm afraid this is going to have to be the last question uh, because I'm very conscious of time, so please go ahead. I got lucky, didn't I? <laughs> Thanks to you both for coming to have a conversation here. Um, given both of your involvement in Australian politics, this is for both of you, do you see a difference given your experience in both of the parties between the attitudes towards Australia's role in this US-China tension? Okay, Julie, over to you. <laughs> well, I resigned as foreign minister back in 2018 and since that time the most significant shift I think in Australia's foreign policy was AUKUS. I think one of the most significant shifts which was to uh, reaffirm and uh, restate the alliance with the United States and this was at a time when relations with China were probably at the worst that I've certainly seen in my 20 years. And so it was obviously a deliberate foreign policy direction to um, envelop Australia's foreign policy within the US and to a lesser extent UK embrace at a time when uh, our focus was certainly not on re-establishing a relationship with China as Kevin would know, there is no diplomatic connection with China at present. Uh, I believe that the new Chinese ambassador has met with ministers in the government, but that would have to be the first connection that's been made in a long time. So, yeah, there has been, I think, a significant change in the last two years. I think yeah, well, the way I'd conclude our conversation this evening on this one is that whoever was the government of Australia at present would have a challenge on their hands because China has become increasingly assertive. 
And, and that is because, as we discussed earlier, uh, China has become more powerful. And the power matrix has been an unfolding one. It began, if you like, when we delivered the Defence White Paper in 2009 and recommended doubling the submarine fleet, increasing the surface fleet, the Royal Australian Navy by a third and a range of other measures because we began to identify then uh, from the intelligence that things were changing. The military outlays, force structure, all sorts of things. And, and um, our Chinese friends do not welcome that uh, 2009 Defence White Paper. But it has been an accentuating trend since then, and particularly since 2012, when Xi Jinping became General Secretary. So that's my first point. Whoever is in office would find this a big challenge. The second is, <clears throat> my argument in dealing with the China challenge is that we need to separate constantly what I describe as an effective operational strategy for Australia, as opposed to too much volume in our declaratory strategy in dealing with China. And often an assumption on the part of certain politicians, like the idiot Dutton, um, <laughs> that remain mum, okay? The, um, uh, quiet. The, uh, <laughs> that um, the more you shout and the more hair you stitch onto your chest of a morning, somehow better, uh, the, the better your overall strategic circumstances with China and the United States might be. That's just declaratory bullshit. Um, and it's, 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 it's directed at an Australian domestic political audience. It's not directed at the substance of an effective operational strategy of dealing with a real world challenge, which we've just spent the last hour discussing. And so therefore, the attention of an incoming government, be it Liberal or Labor, must be on the operational dimensions of an effective strategy, which is both military, economic, technological, people to people and the rest, uh, rather than thinking that strategy equals pulling out the bullhorn, the megaphone every Monday morning at, f at you know, 9 a.m., blasting it off on the front pages of the Murdoch rag and assuming that that equals a strategy, which it does not. That cannot be the last word on this. <laughs> <laughs> so let me just say, there was a time when both sides of politics would say it is not a choice between the United States and China. We don't have to choose and neither will make us choose if we are able to manage the bipartisan relationships effectively. And I think over many years both sides of politics did do that. Uh, the United States was our number one strategic defence and economic partner more broadly. And China was and is now by far and away our largest trading partner. We have a very different worldview from China, yet it was how we manage our differences that counted. The United States understood that. To a lesser extent, China understood it, but nevertheless they respected it when we did it. And I think that's what's missing now, that the belief that you can manage these very challenging relationships and you don't have to choose to the extent that it appears we have done. Now, yes, China is now a much more powerful nation. It is much more able to make demands. But nevertheless, I think what I found fascinating over the whole Russia-Ukraine um, conflict is the way China has responded. It's been quite insightful that China is looking long-term, thinking this is not just a black and white. We have to manage relationships, not only with the United States and the European Union, Russia, of course, but it was a much more thoughtful response than I had anticipated. So... Um, Let me end on a bipartisan <laughs> note. <laughs> this is my bipartisan point to conclude with, okay. and it's two sentences. If the Chinese system was trying to send a signal to the Australian political system that post-election, whoever wins the election, Labor or Liberal, that they were interested in a reset in the bilateral relationship, I could not think of a dumber thing to do than what they just did in the Solomons. This is a really foolish act uh, in terms of those within the Chinese system who may have been looking for the opportunity for a circuit breaker, a reset.
Uh, so whoever forms the next government of Australia, let me say this on a bipartisan basis, that actually alters the game yet again. You know, what we need to see is the detail in that Solomon Islands Agreement because my fear is that, I, I know we've seen the draft, but my fear is that China absolutely dominated those negotiations. And if we were able to view that agreement, which I understand hasn't even been to Solomon Islands Parliament, we would have an understanding, a better understanding of China's intentions, aspirations and um, likely behaviour in the Pacific. And because you're the Chancellor, I'm going to shut up. <laughs> And give you the last word. You're the boss of this place. I'm handing back to our yes, dear professor. I'm doing my best to, to wrangle these two, uh, very unsuccessfully. <laughs> so it's my very happy task as uh, Dean of the College of Asia and the Pacific, which is a, a college that is um, deeply, deeply rooted in, in all aspects of, uh, of this conversation. Um, uh, I have the great privilege of, of offering a vote of thanks, uh, both to uh, uh, the author of the book, former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd, but also to our, our Chancellor and, and former Foreign Minister, Julie Bishop. Um, there are just a couple of things, I know we're over time, but really a couple of things I'd like to, to leave you with. You know, both um, the Chancellor and the former Prime Minister have demonstrated uh, the, the vital importance of one, curiosity about other people, other places, um, and the extent to which um, some of us maybe don't have that curiosity because we are too complacent in our own uh, position, uh, but there is something inherently important about learning languages, about understanding other people's histories and other people's points of view. But that goes along with endeavor. None of this is easy and none of this is short term. And I think what the conversation uh, has demonstrated is both that look what happens if you get an education at the ANU, number one. <laughs> I have to say that, uh, but it's evident here. Um, but also, what we lose in public debate and public conversation by the sloganeering, by the constant reduction, by the appeal to the lowest common denominator, these are not easy issues. These are issues that demand understanding, knowledge, respect, and engagement. And we need to have that. Uh, but in order to have that, we need to have a population, a citizenry, that understand that it is important to know uh, the language, to understand the history, whether that's China, whether it's Indonesia, whether it uh, is in the Pacific. Um, so that's the first thing. Uh, and we know that that's something that is declining in Australia, and it's something to be concerned about. And the second thing is, in order to do um, some of the things that are in the book in terms of developing new rules and guardrails, we need a public service that can do that. We need a public service that has that capability. Um, and I think there is a, a very important question which you, you, know, you don't come to directly in the big book, but I'm sure you, you have very clear views on. You know, what does it mean for our public service that uh, the Department of Foreign, Affa Foreign Affairs and Trade um, is not uh, perhaps as, as robust as, as it might be, as it could be, as it should be. So one of the challenges, I think, for whoever is next in government is what they do about both diplomacy specifically, but also about uh, broader public service competence in order that uh, politicians can have the frank and fearless advice that they say they want, but uh, very often don't appear to uh, require. But um, that's just my plea for people to be educated, keep it being educated and, and thinking broadly about uh, what's possible in order that we might, um, as former Prime Minister Rudd suggests, you know, get to a place where uh, we can avoid war and uh, that we don't end up as a result of our own foolishness, uh, if nothing else, um, on a pathway to war that, that we should and could be able to avoid. Um, and with that, I would just like you to invite you again to congratulate both our conversationists this evening. <laughs>